good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Julian from Parrot Drones, and I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing with open source right now. And I've been doing and we've been doing for approximately a year and a half now because we we hadn't so many things doing doing going on about open source and drones. So I'm going to basically talk to you about what I've done on Parrot Bebop 2, which is was quite a year ago. Then I'll talk about Parrot Disco, which is our, our new flying wing we've just released, and what I've done and when we've done with it and open source software, I'll talk to you about adding video features to that, which is an ongoing work. And um, I'll talk to you about yeah, video features and then I'll explain how to build the code and what's left to do. And I'll talk about also a thing called Parrot Slam Dunk, which is a small module during stereo vision camera with Jetson TK1. So, um, First of all, that's the Parrot Bebop 2. I have one, but I broke it while doing stupid things with it. I always do that when I play with open source software. I sometimes crash the drones because, yeah, it doesn't just work when, like when you buy one. Uh, so it's 500 grams approximately. It runs a dual Cortex-A9 that we've designed. Yeah, we love to design things and do things on, on our own, which is sometimes relevant, sometimes not. But this is, at least it was a lot of fun to do our own SOC and develop all the drivers, support the Linux kernel and stuff. Problem, yeah, talked about that later. Uh, we have lots of sensors on it. We have an IMU barometer, compass, vertical camera for doing optical flow. Uh, we have a sonar, a GPS. Yeah, it's, it's very small, but it's, uh, yeah, it embeds a lot of sensors. It's just like that, with the propels on, usually. Um, yeah, it's a very old kernel now. It wasn't two years ago, but now, yeah, three, three or four years ago, now it's very old. And um, every time I'm trying to push so we can spend time to mainline it or pay someone to do so, well, uh, people tend to say that it's not relevant because we're going to drop the support for it, but we continue making product on it every time. So I guess at some point it's going to be true that we're not going to release any more um, product with this soft, with, with this SOC, but yeah. I was right, <laughs> yeah, but anyway. Um, so it has a front camera with a fisheye lens, and it uses that to do video stabilization because it captures a very wide angle, and with some data, it, it's capable of generating a smaller image, but stabilized. Um, I've, been try I've been working on... I've met lots of people in this conference, and, and some, uh, some of them convinced me that it was a very good idea to port an open source software called ArduPilot on Bebop 2, and it sounded a lot of fun, so I asked my boss, and he basically let me do it. So I worked a few months to port ArduPilot. I just explained what it consists on. It's, um, so this is the hardware architecture of the Bebop 2 regarding the main SOC. So Parrot 7, dual Cortex-A9 with a Linux kernel. And these are all the peripherals you can see. So there are the two cameras there, connected on camera interfaces and on the same I2C bus. Uh, there's, yeah, lots of I2C buses. We love that. So there is um, the, the compass, the barometer, and the ESC. ESC is a motor controller. It's to control brushless uh, motors, which is kind of tricky. And um, then you have uh, the IMU, MPU6050, and there's a heating resistor in order to, yeah, to control the temperature on it. You need it to be as stable as possible. So there is it's just a PWM on a resistor, but it works very well. Uh, we have uh, an SPI bus connected to a microphone and an ADC. This is to do sonar. It's lots of fun because it's... Uh, SPI bus is used to send pulses, which is quite unusual, but we send pulses with SPI bus, and then we receive the echoes with, an, with a microphone connected on an ADC connected to the PMU connected via IIO drivers and then LibIO, so it's also a lot of fun. And we have a GPS on UART, which is pretty standard. So ArduPilot is uh, open source, it's GPL v3. It's uh, originally developed to run on an Arduino, but it's not Arduino anymore. We are having internally lots of debate right now to what's going to be the next name for it, but it's difficult to drop a name and choose another one. Problem is people think it's Arduino-based because it's called ArduPilot. So if you have ideas, uh, I'll try to submit them. It's in C++. 
It was originally in Arduino language and PDE files, but it's been dropped, uh, fortunately, two years ago. And some Linux boards already supported um, before Bebop. There were <laughs> Beagle Bone Black with an extension. There were, uh, yeah, called Pix, Pix Hawk Fire Cape or something like that. And there are now uh, pretty many boards running Linux, Intel boards, uh, Raspberry Pis with uh, capes and stuff. So there are many boards. Um, you have vehicle-specific flight code in it, which is copter, plane, and rover, meaning you can basically fly all of them with, uh, with ArduPilot. You can adapt it to fly on a plane, but you can also fly on a quadcopter, uh, any number of propellers, three, two, no, two doesn't work. Uh, shared, you have uh, shared libraries that include sensor drivers. By drivers, understand user land drivers. This is bad. and. We are all working to get this better, and at some point, I hope we can port everything to that is on Linux, uh, on IIO drivers for sensors, and even for motors. I think it's possible because we've done it internally. We have uh, hardware abstraction layers called APHAL something. So you have APHAL Linux giving access to SPI dev and stuff like that to do user land drivers. Um, yeah, I have few videos just to show it works. So Randy McKay is the maintainer of the copter. And so he shows, yeah, we don't hear it very well, but. So he's just flying it in his garden. He shows how it works and controlling it with a USB gamepad. And that's how you pilot running on it. It took me about three weeks and or months to port it because it's very, it's pretty straightforward to port it on our drone. It was also very interesting because I learned a lot about drones themselves. I wasn't a drone developer before that. So he does uh, missions. You can do mission planning with ground control stations. And it's... Do mission planning. And then you can have some more interesting stuff going on. Like this. So implemented fun things like that. So you throw it in the air and it stabilizes itself. And some will also try to implement funny things like, yeah. I drop it out of the window. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it almost works. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's kind of things I really want people to do with our drones because it's, yeah, it's lots of fun and you obviously won't ask customers to do these kind of things at home because if they break it, they're going to send it back to you. But Open source is something that allows people to play with drones in this way. And Bebop is kind of convenient for that because it's small. It's difficult to break. You can. But here I played too much. I broke a motor. It, I can buy a new one. Even if I, was, if I wasn't working for Parrot, I could buy a new motor and put, put it back. So it's not a big concern. It costs, yeah, it's still an amount of money, it's 500 bucks, but you can make drones for 5,000 if you want. So it's relatively small amount of money. Um, then we've released this year what's called Disco. So I haven't put the wings with me. So Disco is a, is a wing. Here is just without the wings. I didn't want to bring them anyway. I wasn't going to fly it because it's, it requires more space than that. It's um, the architecture is very close to the Bebop. You can notice there is the same camera here. There's the same camera underneath. There's the same microphone. Um, it's, um, so the architecture is very close. It has a few additional sensors. The motors obviously are not the same because there's only one propeller here and there are servos, just two servos output. And uh, the main board, uh, it can be used on another vehicle. It was the goal, those main board here, is the, the goal when we created it was to be able to use it on another vehicle. So we wanted to target hobbyists, research and education, 
And we originally, the people who designed the product didn't, weren't thinking about ArduPilot at all, but we discussed with them and we convinced them that ArduPlane was the perfect candidate for education and research and that it's going to be much easier than doing anything else because we already had the code ported to the Bebop and it wasn't a big amount of work. Um, and with the community I met when I started porting ArduPilot on the Bebop, there was, I knew who were the maintainer and the maintainer is Tridge. So it's Andrew Tridgel, he's a widely known open source developer and he loves planes and fixed wings and stuff. So we contracted him to do the porting. I could have done it myself, but I knew it was going to be better if he did, if he did it, especially if he wanted to, to send the product, to sell the product. Uh, so we paid him to port ArduPilot on Disco and settle all the things really good so people can really fly it easily. And uh, so there are a few additional differences with the Bebop 2 on this one. There is an airspeed sensor. It's a pitot tube. I'm sure some of you have, have heard about that. So it's, it's implemented. It's just on the bottom. There is a small hole and it compares the pressure between the the air speed that the air that enters and the actual pressure and it gives him the the speed of the air which is very important with the plane because basically it can it cannot uh, fly if the air speed is under something but it's not the same as the gps speed because if you have lots of wind it can basically stay on its place it's uh, it's just the air speed that matters so it has an air speed sensor uh, you have rc input which you don't have on the bebop so you can plug your, your hobbyist RC, you plug the receiver to the, um, to the chuck or to the disco, and then you can pilot it with your regular remote. You can do that with the regular software in manual mode, but ArduPilot has different flight modes, which uh, makes it a bit more fun for hobbyists. You have differences with the ESC, obviously, because there are one motor instead of four, and yeah, it's a bit different. It can, it can run backwards. It's very useful when you try to land, because you basically approach and at some point you have to just uh, uh, break and if you go backwards it goes very fast and it can land very smoothly. So we had originally compass calibration issues because uh, yeah, we, the first hardwares had problems so we had to work a lot about that and then in the end the last hardwares were alright but we kind of struggled with the compass. Um, he made a wiki for users so now any user can run a disco with ArduPilot, ArduPlane. And this is, yeah, it's online. People can already play with it. It can be tricky at some point. So yeah, if you buy a disco, just make sure you, you, you're prepared to spend time on it because yeah, this kind of software is, very, is a lot of fun for hobbyists and for regular people who just say, oh, I'm just gonna try to fly something else. It's a bit complicated right now. It's gonna be better at some point. Uh, so what was missing? It was um, video. So the Bebop is streaming video and um, it's able to stabilize the video on three axes and the disco has the same and we really want to give the possibility to the users of the open source community to have the same. So we wanted to give access to video. Um, so what's fun is, I'm gonna turn this on right now, is that um, we, we come from a world of RTOSes. We started going to Linux because it offered lots of possibilities, but our developers now have switched, I think, but when they started working on the drone, it was like five years ago, there were still RTOS developers. So what they did was one big process, which handles, well, everything. If you connect to the drone, I'm gonna show that right now. If I can. Yeah. Always takes a bit of time to start. Okay. So I'm connected to it. You can connect it via ADB. No. But we come from also afterwards, after autosis, we came to Android in the car. We've been doing many different things in Parrot. And, um, yep, oh, the Wi-Fi is not connected. 
yeah, the, we've been doing many things in Parrot, and Android is one of them. So, so we, we just took the daemon. ADB seems very convenient and lightweight to, to connect. OK, so when it doesn't, it doesn't. So <laughs> the Wi-Fi doesn't seem to want to connect. But what you can see, if I can connect with the Wi-Fi, is that um, there is just one big process uh, handling everything. And so um, we had lots of threads and priorities, like an RTOS. It's just like we ported everything that was in the RTOS in one big process. So this is for the official software. It has little reusability and high maintenance overhead. And so we already switched to a new architecture internally to split between lots of processes, or not a lot, but different, at least so that when the video crashes, it doesn't crash the drone. So, because if you have a bug in video processing, it, it kills the process and then the drone crashes. So we split the processes and we have now three main processes. We have the autopilot, we have the control part, and we have video processing. We use an IPC to exchange data because when you want to stabilize video, you need sensor data, we, you need some data from the autopilot, and then you can mix all that and take video and stabilize it. So if the drone tells you it's, it's like this, you can basically f turn the image to put it back in its place. Um, the process in charge of that is called Parrot Imaging Process, PIMP. And uh, we use libraries that we've open sourced for that because we want to open source as much as we can. We have our secrets like any company, but anything that's not secret, if it can be open source, we'll open source it. So it's called libSHData uh, SH and libTelemetry. It's uh, based on uh, shared memory. I'll come back to that later. And it uses sh shared memory. It's on our GitHub. So the imaging process is like that. You have an application based on GStreamer. You have a V4L2 source. Then you have the stabilization process, or not process library. And you have, on one way, what's sent over the network on RTP <coughs> using GStreamer components. You have, yeah, sometimes photos and sometimes um, H.264, like what's recorded on the flash memory. So the lib telemetry, which we use, is a lib to exchange data at high rate between processes in Linux. It's built on top of another library that we wrote, which is called libsh data, which is based on shared memories. And the goal is to have something that's non-blocking. Because the biggest, one of the biggest issues we had with the one process thing is that you can basically you want to access data from the autopilot, like let's say the attitude, the position of the drone. You have to say, oh, OK, I'll put a mutex there, and then I'll access this, and I'll do something with the data. And then you end up with priority inversions everywhere. And you have uh, the autopilot that's blocked that some, by something that's writing in the flash memory, which is very low priority. And you end up with a drone that doesn't fly well. And you can see that very easily. When you're doing LTTNG traces, you can see that, wow, my process, my my very high priority thread is blocked by something else. So then you can go with priority inheritance, but it poses other issues, and then in the, in the end, you're doomed. So what you need is a non-blocking process to exchange data. So it, it pushes data to shared memory. It's timestamped, which is very convenient. You, you timestamp the data, you push it with very accurate timestamp, and then when you need to stabilize video, you just get the data you need from the shared memories to achieve a good stabilization according to the timestamp of the frame you're wanting to stabilize. You can find both of them on our GitHub. And um, yeah, try again to connect to the drone to see if this time he wants. So. The video implementation um, for that, so we have, so to come back, we have our own processes. And so I ported our imaging process to a new architecture where the autopilot wasn't our regular autopilot, but instead the open source software called ArduPilot. What we needed is exporting data from the autopilot to outside. So Tridge implemented um, a plugin system with hooks 
at some points of the software, of the RG Pilot software, to export some data. Uh, this is what one of the hooks look like, and basically you just see in the end you can push the sample to telemetry. The hook is sent when there is an AHRS, which is the estimator update. This gives uh, the quaternion. Quaternion, for those who don't know and probably lots of you, is uh, another way to express an attitude than roll, pitch, and yo, which is, yeah, it just means the drone is like that, or like that, like that, or like that. You need that to stabilize video, so it gives you that, and you export the data using a timestamp. Yeah, here I just took this timestamp, but it's, yeah, you have lots of different ways to get a timestamp. And then you just do that if it works, and you can basically, okay, now it's connected. Does it want to connect via ADB this time? Yeah. So, this is the regular firmware. So, you can see the big process here is called Dragon Prog. Takes, yeah, 49% of one CPU and it's worse when, it's, when it flies. You can see that the, there are different things going on in it. Everyone can do that at home anyway if you really want to hack drones or do something like that. There's the vision. Vision is uh, optical flow. You have, uh, yeah, this is uh, for um, auto exposure and auto white balance. Calibri is our autopilot. You have angles, yeah, calculation for cam angles, HAL, yeah, reprojection. Okay. So basically, what we, you can do now and we implement it is you press the button three times and then the big process disappears, and uh, instead you have Arduplane and PIMP, which is the imaging process. Then you can just start streaming, giving an IP and a port. Just have to check that my IP hasn't changed. It hasn't. So you can basically start streaming, and then on the other side you can use Cheese Streamer when it wants. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's it's just it's on my my side. So you're there. So you can see that the image is approximately because it's still on the work, but it's stabilized. You can do that, and the video. It's stabilized on one axis. In fact, it's not stabilized in Yo. It's stabilized on roll, so we can roll the drone, and it stays stabilized. It's stabilized on pitch too. Yeah, it's two. Yeah, it's stabilized on two axes, but it's blocked. It's locked to the Yo axis. So you can flip. What you can also notice is that when you just basically you put this like that, and you you can you can kill a process that's doing autopilot, supposing my mouse wants it. Yeah. Yep. So you can, yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, like I said, I do stupid things with my drone and this one has probably taken a few shocks. We have a, um, a, a fan. There's a fan inside, and this one has been crashing too much times, I think, too many times, so, yeah, the, the fan isn't working very well. Uh, and I also use prototypes that are a bit not very correct, not the same level as mass production, because I know I'm going to break them, so I prefer br to break uh, prototypes that are already bad. So, yeah, you can see that this is, yeah, stabilized on roll, and if I stop the autopilot, well, it's not anymore. So... And if I restart it. Can you, can you stabilize on your if you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, uh, what do you stabilize on your, where are you looking? But I didn't realize the problem, but if, yeah. if you wanted to fix on a given target, for instance, and just. Yeah, does it start again? Uh, not that good. Okay. Okay, it takes time. Maybe this time. <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, anyway, so you. 
you can you can stabilize on what you want. Thing is, oh, okay, this time it has started. Just wasn't started. The autopilot took a bit of time to start. So um, yeah, you can stabilize on you, but who are you looking at? It means okay, I stabilize on you in this direction, but if I start and I'm looking in this direction, you have a black image. So yeah. You can stabilize on high frequencies on you, but low at some point you have to get back to where you are. But yes, you, you can, of course, stabilize on any, any axis you want. So yeah, you can just so play video with GStreamer. It's a GStreamer application which is embedded on the drone. Yeah, I'm gonna stop it because it makes too much noise. It's the servos that makes the small noise there. The autopilot, which is different from ours, stabilizes even when it's not flying. <coughs> so the servos try to compensate for the position of the drone. Um, so if you want to build code for Parrot Disco, <coughs> then you can check one of my colleagues' GitHub. Yeah, it has to go back to Parrot's GitHub, but we always work first on our GitHub and then push it back to Parrot's. Uh, you can... You can, if you want to replace the audio pilot version, which is already on a drone, the, this version is not in production yet, but it's gonna be in a few weeks, then you can press the button three times, you get the open source software running. If you wanna replace it, well, you just have to rebuild it from the GitHub of audio pilot. You, yeah, it uses WAF, it's a build system for those who don't know, and uh, you j just configure with board, equal, yeah, minus, minus, board equal disco, and then you build it, and then you can connect via ADB and push it on the target. Yeah, remount and push it. Um, what's left to do again? Well, there are lots of image quality improvements to be done. The, qual the video quality is not the same as the one you can get with the regular software. We have implemented this new architecture as a demo concept for future drones, and if we, we want to reach the same level of quality, we need to do lots of things to improve the image quality. We must improve the stabilization, the auto white balance, and the former software, which is one process and bad and stuff. At least right now, it works better. It's all often the case. So we have to reach the level of functionalities that it has. Um, we have to add Mavlink support to start and stop streaming. So Mavlink is a protocol for drones to exchange with ground control stations, especially. So you can, it's a, it's a protocol where all ground control stations that exist for open source drones uses that, almost. And so you can use it to send data, to, to receive and send commands to the drone. And we need to implement something like that to start streaming. Maybe RTSP at some point also expose the, the streams via RTSP and people so can stream on their RTSP receivers. We can implement and we will piloting from Sky Controller too. Sky Controller is our remote. It works with Wi-Fi, but it has very long range. It can go up to four kilometers, I think, maximum. Yeah, it's longest use case, but yeah. So it's running Linux, and uh, it's very easy to hack also. We have people doing that internally. Maybe I've seen some people wanting to do that also, and we're gonna help them. So you can hack it. Uh, it's still on the same kernel that's used, that's used on the drone. It's the same SOC, it's our SOC called Parrot P7. You can have, you have USB, Wi-Fi, and everything. So you can basically do whatever you want with it, but good thing could be to pilot the regular autopilot and uh, also the open source software with it. We, I really love to allow people to develop um, video plugins, GStreamer plugins, so you can get image at some point, do some processing, export the data to do something else. I don't know what, but there are probably many things that you can do with, uh, yeah, yeah, VR. We already, we are selling the disco with uh, kind of something that looks like the Gear VR, with, where you put your phone and you can have an immersive uh, image. It's done on a regular software, and that could be done also with Audio Pilot. Once we get the video right, you can have that, and uh, yeah, a lot of people could do that, could analyze the video, stabilize it in another way, do something else, maybe even learn how to do an auto exposure, auto white balance, if it, uh, if it interests them. You have, yeah, lots of things you can do with that, so I really love to do that, and I also love to write a fully open source version for the video pipeline, because what I've done with this, I cannot open source everything. Video stabilizations is, is one of our, 
of our kind of secret or thing that we do internally and we don't want to expose. So I could just give access to the regular stream without any stabilization and let people handle everything. That's going to be something I'm going to do, I think, in the next month. Um, that's all for the disco. I'll just talk briefly about something called Parrot Slam Dunk, which is uh, a development kit to, to do autonomous flight. It's on Tegra K1. It has two stereo cameras here and two, so, two microphones to do sonar here, to, lots of sensors. It runs Ubuntu desktop. It's really meant for research and education. It's not meant to be embedded on a drone for a final product. And it supports ROS, which is the robotics operating system, which is not an operating system, but it's something that allows to exchange with lots of robotic components and develop robotic algorithms. And uh, it's widely used in the robotic community, especially open source. It's by the Open Source Robotics Foundation. Um, yeah, it's kind of, a, you can plug it, you can plug a screen and a keyboard and use it as a PC and then you can download the packages you want and develop your algorithms, use stereo cams or use ROS or use whatever you want and you can do something with it. What we're doing internally is plugging it on the top of the Bebop. We analyze and do SLAM and, uh, and object avoidance and stuff like that and we pilot the Bebop via its USB port because you can connect to the USB port and pilot the Bebop with it. You can also do that with the open source software. It demands a bit of work, I must admit, but it, it's feasible. So I'm um, over with the presentation. If you have some questions. Maybe you can grab the microphone that's just the, here. I don't know if it works. So, so how large is the slam dunk? Oh, it's like that. And two stereo cams, so it's an additional that in this, this direction. Should have brought one, I forgot to take one. Yeah, it's this, this size. It's very small board. Maybe. Okay. No. I, that's something I haven't been talking about this. No, we don't provide real-time guarantees. And in fact, you have, uh, the most important thing is that you don't miss samples from the IMU sensor. The IMU sensors uh, have a FIFO, so it's not very, very problematic if you just are a bit late, as long as you are very well synchronized and you're capable of not missing any data from the sensor. So you don't need to achieve hard real time to do an autopilot. What you need to do is never uh, uh, accumulate late, uh, lateness. You must always catch, but if you, there is a small jitter, it's not a big, a big problem if your IMU has a FIFO, because you can read whatever data is and then process it. So yeah, so we are not running any real-time kernel, any preempt RT. We are running uh, SCAD preempt, but no preempt RT. Any more questions? Yep. N no. No, that's what I said. It's uh, it's uh, on 3.4 and it's not on mainline. I've been yeah trying to push to do something in this direction. I work with uh, people who can do that or even do it ourselves. But um, I think my company hasn't yet seen the um, the possibilities that it could offer, and so we haven't. It's of course released and published and uh, on our GitHub and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it's not mainline. So we keep on backport. We have kept on backporting things, especially for video, because we needed to use like latest things from video for Linux, and we've spent a lot of time backporting them to our 3.4 kernel, which is sometimes very difficult. Okay. No more question. Okay, then. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you mean with the regular firmware? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, what we sell is uh, 220, I think, milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's not at the level of, uh, let's say, racing drones. But it's not the point because it's, uh, 
it's um, it's something that you, you can pilot and you you have the immersive flights which is very interesting and the goal is not to have uh, very low latency autopilots in that it's not racing but yeah the the shortest the latency is the better it is in fact i think there are some limitations from our original software that can be uh, overcome by switching to the new architecture because uh, yeah, GStreamer allows us to do, have more flexibility and to implement different pipelines for streaming and recording, which is not the case. So you have lots of way to improve it. We are just at the beginning of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Um, your your GStreamer pipeline, you were using AB NKH264. Uh, are you doing all your image stabilization in software? And, and are you using software encode because you don't have any hardware encoders? Uh, on the Bebop? No, we have hardware encoders, and we have the stabilization uh, is done over GPU. It uses uh, GStreamer plugins using OpenGL. So we are very, uh, very backwards on the kernel, and we're very up to date on the GStreamer. Okay, so your GStreamer pipeline wasn't using any hardware. <laughs> no, the, um, the GStreamer pipeline I showed was on the PC side to decode the stream, and our, our pipeline on GStreamer on the drone it uses the stabilization, it uses GPU over OpenGL, and it uses hardware encoder to do uh, encoding, yeah. On, on this um, dual Cortex A9, you couldn't uh, st possibly uh, stream at 720p and record at 180p at the same time without a hardware encoder. It's not possible. Even on higher hand, it's, uh, it's complicated, yes? Yeah, there are some reasons for that. The first one is, at first, when they started to work on it, they could manage to have it fly without it. So it's hard to convince people that you have to do real time if it works without. Uh, at some point, we have probably studied a bit what was necessary to switch to the preempt RT patch and identified that it wasn't mandatory, so we decided not to do it. But yeah, I think at some point it could be good. thing is, yeah, we're starting to look at other platforms, including ARM64, and at the moment we switched, then there wasn't RT preamp, RT patch on ARM64, so we're still not going to use that. I think that it's all right to use without preempt RT patch. It's a uh, thing is, for very hard real-time things, you must have something dedicated to it. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, yeah, you, you can use a separate microcontroller, you can use some, sometimes you have embedded microcontrollers inside the big SOCs that can achieve some real-time things, so if you, or even hardware blocks, if you have, yeah, I'm thinking uh, sensors are, are fine, but different between IMUs and uh, cameras is that IMUs are slaves and cameras are master on the bus. And it's very different. It means that when cameras need to, to have lots, uh, big amounts of data, and everything is done, like the main CPU is the slave, which is very convenient because it keeps on sending data, and you have hardware blocks that keeps on receiving data, and it can timestamp it uh, on hardware and do some kind of things. And if we had the same mechanisms for IMUs, uh, barrows, and stuff, it would be very easy if you had hardware blocks with very standard ways to get data, and that can Timestamp everything. Once you've timestamped everything, you've won. You don't need to have um, microsecond latency to pilot. You need to have microsecond latency on the timestamps. You need to have microsecond accuracy on the timestamps. So that's all about timestamps. It's not about uh, reactivity, I think. Because if you see what a drone do does, the autopilot runs at 400 hertz for uh, copters, but for plane, it can run at 50 hertz. It works perfectly well at 50 hertz. Thing is, it just needs to have correct timestamps. Any other question? Okay then, thank you very much.